Good evening, and welcome to Lethal First Baptist Church. Tonight we're up to chapter 5 in the book of Zechariah in our Wednesday night Bible study. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. Lord, we are amazed at your power. We love how you love us. We are grateful for your mercy. Lord, in your word, we see things that are hard to understand. And we are grateful that you love us and love us enough to give us the answers if we will but listen. Give us wisdom as you have promised you will. That we would understand your word and your will. We beg this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. In the last two chapters, we've talked about Joshua, the high priest, being cleansed. God made him clean for the sake of the sacrifice and told him that he was a, a type. He and the other priests were miracles, were literally sons of wonder because they were the image of Jesus Christ, the image of the coming Messiah. Last week, just as God authenticated and empowered Joshua, God did the same for Zerubbabel, telling him, not only are you going to fix the temple, you're going to rebuild the temple, but it's going to be done very well in your lifetime. You're the one who's going to get it done. Tonight, God says, with all of these blessings and a rebuilt Jerusalem that will one day be more glorious than ever before, a rebuilt temple that will be even more glorious because it'll be the, the abode of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. Tonight, God says, even with all that, he still demands holiness. His people have to be pure. That's a hard thing because we know that we're human. But sometimes we make a mistake and say, well, I've been cleansed with the blood of Jesus, so I can do whatever I want to. That is not true. That is the way of hell. That's what happened to the people, of the nation of Israel, the first two times they were destroyed. The northern kingdom, the 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 northern ten tribes, they thought, well, we're Jewish. We're the sons of Abraham. We're protected. And then engaged in sin, which should never happen. If you're the child of God, you should live like it. Then later, and of course, the northern kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrians. And then about 150 years later, the southern kingdom, Judah, with Jerusalem, was destroyed by the Babylonians. Same reason. And we talked all about that in the past. And God's going to tell them, look, you're my people. And as long as you're my people, I have wondrous blessings for you. But I'm not going to tolerate sinfulness we can make mistakes but our hearts had better stay in the right place it was sin and lack of faith and, and be careful those two always go together sin makes me well sin destroys my faith the more sin I engage in the farther away from God I know myself to be. That's what destroyed Israel the first time, and it can do it again, and it can do it with you. 
Tonight's Bible study is going to be very short, unless I just get long-winded. But I think the shortness of this chapter, it's just 11 verses, may mean that God wants us to spend more time thinking about this chapter. So we begin. Then I turned and raised my eyes. Now this, from last week, he was awoken to see things. This time he's still awake, but he turns on his own and raises his, raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. Now literally in the Hebrew, a flying roll because they would roll um, paper up. Be it papyrus or parchment, they would roll it up and uh, after writing on it. And this one's flying. So this is almost like a dream sim um, symbolism here. A giant flying scroll. And he, the angel, said, what do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits. Now remember, a cubit is, the, is measuring from the, uh, your elbow to the tip of your finger. And the reason for that was, if you would buy, say, if a woman were buying fabric, it would be one, two cubits, three, four. As she wrapped around her arm, she's counting. They standardized it, by the way, to the king's, king's um, dimensions. So the people wanted a very tall king. If you were a woman and you buy three cubits of fabric and you have a long-armed king, you're getting more fabric for the dollar than if you had a short king. So the businessmen wanted a short king. The, the common people wanted a tall king. But they based it on the king's arm. So we basically round off nowadays to a foot and a half, 18 inches. So if it's 20 cubits, that means it's 30 feet long. So it was 30 feet long. This is a big scroll. And it's width 10 cubits, so 15 feet. It's flying through the air, and it's 30 feet by 15 feet. And he said to me, this is the curse. You see, the, the scroll is the, the word of God. It's God made a, an, or, um, an ordinance, a statute, a law. He wrote it down. And if you disobey this, th this law of God, there is a curse involved. And he says, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth, not just the people of Israel. Not only are they under the law, everyone's under the law. Every thief shall be expelled. Now that's in quotation marks because that's what the curse reads. Every thief shall be expelled. Theft is, and most scholars understand this, and the early Jewish rabbis did as well. This is summing up the Ten Commandments. When Jesus was asked, for example, what the greatest commandment was, he said the first half of the Ten Commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he says, and the second one is like it. Jesus was saying the Ten Commandments are boiled into two things. Love God, love your neighbor. And this is exactly what God is telling Zechariah here. If you're a thief, you're harming people. You may say, well, I only take it from people who can afford it. Any time you steal, you've hurt someone. You've damaged them. Maybe it didn't hurt them to lose the money, but the stores they would have gone to, those sales clerks hurt. When we steal, we hurt. Murder is simply stealing someone's life. If I'm going to love my neighbor, I can't steal from him. Everything shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll. So God says the first law is, if you don't 
if you steal from your neighbor, you're going to be under the curse. And, and quote, every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of it. So on one side, it's you don't steal from people. The second side, you don't lie, you don't lie against God. When I lie in the name of God, a perjurer, uh, King James says, whoever, um, whoever swe- takes an oath, because when I take an oath, when I commit perjury, and you can do it out of court as well as in court, I've sinned against God. When I say I swear before God and then tell a lie, I have assaulted God. I have diminished him. I have uh, demeaned him. To, to tell a lie in the name of God is to hurt God. So the first part of the scroll says, the one side of the scroll says, you don't hurt people by stealing from them. The second part, you don't hurt God by lying against his name. By the way, I believe that pretty much covers all sin. Every sin we commit is one of those two. If you have an affair, you have ruined the marriage of another man. We understand stealing money, stealing property. But any sin steals from someone and hurts them. Verse 4, I will send out the curse says the Lord of hosts, I will declare it, make it the law, and I will, inf- and my angels will enforce it. I am almighty God. I will send out the curse. This flying curse is going out to all the world. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. Either one. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it, consume the house, with its timber and stones. When we sin, we bring rot, filth, damage into our homes. When you and I sin, we harm the people who live with us by dirtying them. And God says, that curse is upon you, but it'll be upon your family because they live with you. If you're engaging in sin, it hurts you and it hurts your children. It hurts your spouse. It hurts everyone who lives in the house with you. We lie to ourselves and think we can commit a sin and keep it totally private. There are people who say, well, uh, there are even supposed pastors who believe that well you can have an affair so long as nobody knows and nobody gets hurt the bible says everyone gets hurt everyone in your home gets hurt when you commit sin there is a curse involved verse 5 then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth Verse 6, so I asked, what is it? He said, it's a basket. Now, in the, in the Hebrew and in the King James, it's um, an ephah. Well, an ephah was a, a, a unit of measure. And the easiest way to remember it, it's slightly more than a bushel basket. So there's a bushel basket. These translators decided to um, say, it's a bushel basket that's going forth. Again, this is like a dream, the the imagery. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. Who they? Sinners. This is what sinners can expect. 
verse 7, here is a lead disc in the King James, a lead stone. It was a, a round piece of lead that, would, that perfectly fit the top of the bushel basket. It was a lid, and it's a heavy lid. Once you're thrown into that basket, you can't push it off. You can't get out. Here is a lead disc lifted up, and this is a woman sitting inside the basket. So there's a woman inside this bushel basket. Now, some people have noted that a bushel might be about 33 gallons of, um, of dry measurement, and that's big, but certainly it would take a very small person to fit into that basket. So some people wonder if maybe the basket is larger in the dream, but in the vision, but remember, this is the vision. God's making a point. There's a woman inside. In verse 8, then he said, this is wickedness. Now, why, did it, why was it a woman? Well, a lot of people wonder and argue about it, but I think the simplest, simplest answer is that in the Greek and in the Hebrew, words have neuter endings, and they have male endings, and they have female e endings. And the word wickedness has a female ending. Now, before you read something into that, the word uh, wisdom is also, also has a female ending. So, probably for no other reason, other reason than that, than because their language put a female ending on the word of wickedness, it's a woman sitting inside the, back, the basket. This woman represents all the people. If the first vision of the flying scroll was against one person who steals or one person who fa swears falsely in the name of God, this one is about the nation of Israel. It's about all the people. This is, wicked, this is wickedness, he said, and he thrust her down into the basket. She wants out, but she can't get out, and threw the lead cover over its mouth. So he slams down the lead cover, and she's in there. The imagery that she's trapped in there. Wickedness is trapped in there. The nation is trapped in there. Well, that's exactly what happened the first two times. Israel, northern kingdom, sinned and was taken into captivity. Then Judah, the southern kingdom, sinned and were taken in captivity to Babylon. God's saying, I have done all these wonderful things. I am rebuilding Jerusalem. I'm rebuilding the temple. I will anoint your leaders so that they will be they will be more than adequate. They will reflect my glory. But you have to be holy. Verse 9. Then I raised my eyes and looked. There were two women coming from the wind, coming with the wind in their wings. Now, these are probably angels. Some people try to argue that they're wicked people only because they had stork wings. And stork, stork was a, a meat that was not kosher. But you see, the, the stork is also known for his strength. A stork can carry heavy loads. The reason for the old the old fable about storks carrying babies. Uh, you know, how was I, how did I get here? The stork brought you. Storks had, have great strength and can carry heavy loads. And that's probably the only reason. I believe these are angels. They had the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven between the, in the air, but in, in the sky, in the air below the, below the heavens, above the earth. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. That's another name for Babylon.
They've been stuck in a bushel basket and sent to Babylon. The point's pretty clear. If you're my people, I have great blessings for you. But if you're not my people, I'll send you back to Babylon. They had just come from a great captivity, the Babylonian captivity, this magnificent nation reduced to a few tens of thousands, probably around 50,000 people. And God says, if you don't get it right, I'll send you back. To build a house for it in the land of Shinar, when it is ready, when the house is ready, the basket will be set there on its base, like an idol. The word in the Hebrew for idol is worthless or empty. The ancient Jews knew that all of these idols were a waste of your time. They would tell their neighbors, you're praying to a piece of metal. You're praying to a piece of wood or rock. There's nothing there. And God is also, not only is he saying you'll go back to Babylon, but you can go be pagan with the rest of them. If you want to be like Babylon, you go be pagan. This is reasonable on God's part. He has done more than enough. He has rescued them from the Babylonian captivity. He has brought them back to Jerusalem. He has protected them. He has given them men, the prophets, to speak for him. And they need to be reminded. If you don't like it, I can send you back to Babylon. God says that to you and me. Just because your mother and father were saved, just because you were raised in church, God says, if you really want to go to hell, I'll let you. But once you climb in that basket, I'm not going to let I'm not going to lift the lid. We must be the people of God in truth as well as in name. Jesus says there are a lot of people at the end of time who are going to call him Lord, Lord. And, and give all these things they did. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Whatever they were doing, they weren't doing it in Jesus' name. He's saying there will be people who called themselves his. who never knew him. Whether there were, some of them are fake to the world and some of them are lying to themselves. And I have to be careful. We each have to be careful. Am I doing what I do while walking with Jesus? Or is he an afterthought? Do I not care about him at all? And personally, I think the healthiest thing to do is to be always seeking revival. I don't think we'll ever have a time when we don't need revival. When we don't need the flames fanned or the dying embers blowed upon gently until they, they light back up. We need revival. I have learned that it's the people who least need revival who are the ones who pray for it the most. The closer you get to God, the more you feel it when you're not close. Or not as close as you want to be. A lot of people are going to be surprised on Judgment Day because they're going to say, I didn't feel any problem. I didn't notice anything was wrong. But when they're asked a question and are forced to answer honestly, did you walk with Jesus? 
they're going to hang their said, heads and say, well, sometimes, but no, not all the time, not enough. Are you walking with the Lord, or is he an afterthought? Is it convenient to be a Christian? Or is Jesus in the center of your heart? And if he's not, it's never too late to call upon him. The God who has forgiven so many times is longing to love us. If only we will let him. God's poured all these blessings out in Zechariah. There are more to come. But we, they needed to hear. Those individuals who sinned are going to bring a curse upon themselves and their household. That's the most frightening part of it to me. That I would bring something into my house that hurts the people I love. And the nation, if the nation goes back to wickedness, I'll stuff you in a bushel basket and fly you back to Babylon. And we see in the revelation of Jesus Christ that Babylon becomes the image of sin, the, whole, the image of the kingdom of Satan. As I said, this was a short chapter, but it's one to think about, and I hope you will, and I hope to see you this Sunday. Meanwhile, in Christ's service and in yours, I am your pastor. Good night.